This is a wonderful opportunity because Head Start was my life for 26 years in Cortland County. Uh, a little background information on myself. I, I graduated from Cortland and SUNY Cortland and I uh, received my master's degree and I taught for seven years in Clinton, New York, fourth grade. And then in 1968, I decided that I wanted to do something different. So I applied to VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America, and I was accepted for an Alaska assignment. And so I, I stayed nine months in a little village called Koniganak, Alaska, along the Bering Sea coast, and in what was called the Kuskokwim region. And uh, um, I was in a brand new village. They, the Eskimos there decided to move from the coast air, area to inland where there wasn't the flooding. The B Bureau of Indian Affairs, BIA, they decided that they should be building the school along the coast, but they never asked the Eskimos that that was their summer camp where they did the fishing and things like that. But they lived inland, and so then the, they had to live where the new school was, and that was a long time. And then in 1967, the younger people there that had the, uh, were just having their own children decided they wanted to move inland. And so I went in in the uh, early, end of July, early August with a partner, Lanche Andrews, who was from Philadelphia, and she was uh, Native uh, American, Black American. African-American. <laughs> African-American, <laughs> can you believe that? Yeah. The most beautiful girl you could imagine. Uh -huh. Well, anyway, so she did social work. There was only 100 people in our village, mm -hmm. And we had uh, two uh, religious uh, areas. One was Moravian, from the Moravians from uh, Moravia, Germany, and then Bethlehem, Pennsylvania is where they were. And then we had the Russian Orthodox because of the, going back to the ownership of Russia, mm -hmm. of Alaska. So I was there for the, the nine and a half months, and I provided a Head Start program in a house that was half the size. And um, How many children were there? I had, they had just asked and got the state to provide uh, a two-room long cabin school. One was the apartment for the, and they were uh, Mormons, a family with three children, and they were the teachers. Max was the upper class and Deanna was the younger children. And they didn't start school until they were in first grade. Mm -hmm. And so they still spoke their native language. And uh, it was my responsibility as an educator to try to introduce to them uh, uh, English. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that when they did go to the school, they would have a little bit of a background because it would be no kindergarten but first grade. Mm -hmm. And I had a partner, and she was with what we called CETA at that time. Mm -hmm. And they provided the pay, her salary. And uh, so Martha would speak to them in their native language. And uh, she would be translating what I was saying in English. So that it was a dual program. Mm -hmm. And we had nothing, but uh, we managed. and. The kids are really very brilliant, and uh, we had some beautiful children there. What an interesting experience that must yeah, have been. It was. And so then in 1970, I decided to try Peace Corps, but it didn't work out too well. But I did go to Peace, uh, Santiago, Chile. And the reason was that Salvador Allende uh, was a socialist, Marxist socialist. Mm -hmm. Uh, elected democratically by the people, but uh, it just didn't work out too well because you still have to go past the presidential uh, a palace and to go to the North American Chilean Institute where I worked. And um, I uh, was a translator and I spoke English to the students and mm -hmm. was teaching English North American mm -hmm. style. 
So then I came back home and lived in Seattle, Washington for a while. And then in 73, in July, I came home and there was an ad in the newspaper looking for Head Start people. And I applied for a teacher position. And Jim Whipple was the CAPCO executive director. He had in somehow or another found out that the Community Action Program, which CAP stands for, was um, no longer in existed, existence in Cortland because of the fact that there had been a conflict between them and the police, the council of Head Start. They were known as Opportunities for Cortland County. And so they were both defunded. With uh, the opportunities of the CAP, they were defunded and then, of course, they were the funding source through federal government for the Head Start program. So therefore, they were no longer available. So there was no longer a CAP program in Cortland. And this was before I came home. And so it was in the 68s, 70s mm -hmm. area. It was almost in the very beginning when they were doing uh, the community action programs during the Kennedy mm -hmm. administration. And uh, so I, got, I was up given the opportunity for an interview with Jim Whipple. And I told him just what I uh, just previously spoke here on the camera, because that's what started me off in preschool education from being an elementary education girl. And uh, a couple of days later, I get a telephone call from Linda King his uh, fi financial person and also his receptionist because CAPCO had started in Binghamton. They uh, applied for the grant and were in the process of getting it. And one of the things that Jim did is he wanted to start a Head Start program back in there. So he did it. But the funding for the Head Start program didn't come until June of 1973 mm -hmm. and I was hired as a Head Start director mm -hmm. because when Linda called me she said Mr. Whipple asked me to call you and that you have been given the position of Head Start director. I said to myself <laughs> and to her, I said I didn't apply for the teacher position. She said no but you have the qualifications mm -hmm. to be a director. So from August 1973 until uh, June 30th 1999, mm -hmm. I was the Head Start director, and that's when they started CAPCO in the new building that they are now. Uh, June 1st, 1979, they uh, made a contract. The executive director of CAPCO was Chris Farkas, mm -hmm. and with Dan McNeil, because we for 20 years mm -hmm. we had um, rented on the second uh, 22 Main Street, the I second floor. It well. yeah. Mm -hmm. and I remember Chris well too. Yes, and uh, but we just didn't have enough room, and we were expanding all the time. So Dan McNeil and Chris made the arrangements, and they took the old burn furniture store mm -hmm. and converted it into the community action program as it, as it is today. The only thing that is different than when Jim Whipple applied for the program with the title. CAPCO, which means Community Action Program, Cortland. Everybody calls it Cortland County Community Action Program. Mm -hmm. But the original name of CAPCO is Community Action Program, Cortland. So Jim said that he had written the grant and it was for a half-time director. Well, in no way could a half-time director do it. Because the program didn't exist when you were hired. That's correct and I was hired to bring it back to Cortland mm -hmm. County. And so uh, he had gotten arrangements with uh, Tom Toomey at the campus school that we would have one room mm -hmm. for campus for the Head Start program. There was supposed to be one at the fire station uh, uh, in McGraw, but that never happened. Mm -hmm. And then the United Methodist Church in Virgil, and we uh, renovated that entire second floor mm -hmm. and met all the obligations of child care and we had to insulate in the kitchen and 
do a lot of things to make it safe and we had to put a fire door in. It was quite an extensive uh, undertaking, but we were able to go into the campus school because it was a classroom, met safety obligations. And we just started with 30 children, 15 in the morning and 15 in the afternoon. And we had our couple station wagons that we had inherited from the old program and a lot of the supplies and stuff. And so we had two bus drivers and they would pick up the kids in the morning and bring them to camp school. They would have lunch, right after lunch they would be taken out to the station wagon and taken to their respective homes. Uh, and then in the meanwhile, they would go out after they delivered their children and pick up the second set of 15 children. So a total of 30 children, mm -hmm. Monday through Friday, three hours a day. How, how were the children selected? The children? Okay, Sar S Sergeant Schreiber, Marie Schreider's mm -hmm. father, mm -hmm. was responsible for the Community Action Program and then bringing in Head Start. Mm -hmm. And the guidelines were that we were to help the poor, the people in poverty. Mm -hmm. So they had to meet very specific financial guidelines. And then 10% of the children had to be labeled special needs. And at that time, most of our special needs children were children that had very uh, minimal uh, speech. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that was because they weren't stimulated in the house mm -hmm. or anything. They were put in front of the television. So we had an excessive, so we made an excessive number of children under more than 10% for uh, handicapped services. And we worked with the college and their speech mm -hmm. department mm -hmm. yeah. to provide the therapy for the children. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a teacher and a teacher assistant. And then our main emphasis was parent involvement. And we were supposed to make sure that we got the parents involved because without the parents, without the family services, we, uh, they would not be successful. And today I'm very proud to say that the children that were there in 73 and on are parents and grandparents mm -hmm. themselves now. But several of their mothers and some of their fathers, they went on one particular person, and she's honored at the Padua Youth Center that they bought, they either they rent it or they bought it, I'm not sure, since I left. But I had tried to get it before mm -hmm. in 1985, um, but they weren't ready to uh, change it to a Head Start program. But anyways, Sharon Johnson was one of the first parents with her husband, John, and they lived at the Pendleton Street Housing mm -hmm. Project. And that's how we called it, the Pendleton. So all the afternoon children for Virgil at the United Methodist Church came from the Pendleton Street housing. So they went up the hill there. And in the morning, they came from Dryden. Mm -hmm. But it was Cortland County, but our taxi service mm -hmm. was Dryden. And um, so again, we had 30 children, total 15, 15. We had our own cook, and she, uh, Wanda, trip, she prepared the lunches for the children and then she would be ready for the second batch wow. of children. So in the very beginning, uh, after we started the Head Start program at the campus school, uh, then we began in Virgil as soon as it met mm -hmm. qualifications and was approved by the state. Uh, we were serving 60 children. Well, we were a program for 90 children. See, and we hadn't gotten uh, McGraw. So we were one of the first in the area that went home-based. And we had 15 children in that program. And that's where I hired teachers to go directly into the home and work with the parents mm -hmm. and whoever was there. And they provided once a week a home-based uh, program is that was that just in McGraw that you did? No, it was wherever we went as far as to Ryder wow. to the yes. I didn't realize that. It, but well, within Cortland County, right? And uh, when I say it's once a week, 
they had different children, so mm -hmm. each day they visited a different family. How many staff did, did you have at the beginning? Do you remember? I can't really give the exact, yeah. but it was, uh, we had, I, I can visualize it, it was six teachers, and two of them were the home-based, mm -hmm. and uh, the others were the two teachers' classroom, two teacher assistants, and then we had home, uh, what we call the uh, home care, and that was our our program for helping the families with health issues, mm -hmm. and we had to make sure the children met the regulations of having dental care mm -hmm. and speech therapy under the special needs and anything else that was required mm -hmm. for their special abilities, and. Um, so there were three on that staff, mm -hmm. and um, that's pretty. Um, that's a remarkable uh, way to start a career here here in Portland to start a program <laughs> from the very beginning, and to go from doing having to do modifications to buildings to trying to make sure that the healthcare needs of these <laughs> kids are being met. I mean, it runs the gamut, doesn't it? Right. And probably. Writing for the funding and supervising the staff. I mean, soup to nuts, right? Well, I did that. Yeah. I, I thought I was pretty proficient in the end. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know how to use, uh, I do know, but I don't like to use, so I never typed. Mm -hmm. I had a secretary that worked for me, and she did the typing. Mm -hmm. And I wrote the grant in a whole longhand. <laughs> and it was yeah. quite thick. Mm -hmm. But I think. That's how every time there was an opportunity to receive um, funding, mm -hmm. it was based on how we were promoting our goals mm -hmm. for the next year. Mm -hmm. So our program went from June 21st to May 29th every year. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I say, uh, we started at uh, Levin Groton Ave with the old Winchell Insurance Company. Capco was on the second floor, we were on the third floor. And then afterwards, we had Ruben Dvorsky as our director, mm -hmm. and he started expanding the weatherization mm -hmm. and or weather or winter. Weatherization. Uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I sometimes I lose the, the, uh, energy, my, the um, energy programs. Yes. yes. Yeah. And uh, they had a place on Charles Street, Char Charles. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, we got the agreement to go to McNeil's building. Yes. And um, we had that contract for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And then we went on June 1st of 1999, mm -hmm. where they are today. Mm -hmm. And um, Do you think that the program has changed very much from when you first started it? Yes. Yeah. When I began, it was very different. And even our our goals and our working relationship with the staff was different. It was family oriented, and we worked with the families. And like we had policy council, which was a requirement was supposed to be their board. And we had and one of the things that I was hired for was that I had to work cooperatively with Community Action Program Capco mm -hmm. because they didn't want anything to happen that had happened previously, mm -hmm. and that was my, my intent of all those years. And um, what happened was then we got so big with all these programs mm -hmm. that CAPCO was funding that that's when they, with Dan McNeil, they made the arrangement where they are today. And I just read in the paper, but I don't want to quote it, it was just last week in the paper. They were refunded again, because June 1st, mm -hmm. and I think they have 200 and some children wow. in the program now, from our original 60 to 90 to that, and they have what they call early childhood mm -hmm. infancy program, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you, it's, it's amazing, so, and to have the parents be involved mm -hmm. and so forth. So I was mentioning Sharon Johnson earlier. And she was one of her first parents, and she volunteered at the classroom. The more they volunteered, the better that they became acquainted mm -hmm. with what was needed for children in preschool age, because 
they were going, they were only four years old at the time. Then we started with three-year-olds. Mm -hmm. Now they're infancy, infant programs. And they even worked with the parent before the, uh, the birth of the child. Mm -hmm. And uh, she didn't have, she was Cheryl Ballantyne, who just came up from Florida a couple of weeks ago. The two of them were aides, but volunteer aides. Mm -hmm. And then they decided that they were going to go and get their GED. And both of them had over five children. Wow. And uh, mm -hmm. they got their GED through the YW, YM, wait, YWCA. And then we had to go to Syracuse, I don't know what building, when they got their um, GED. And Sharon was one of the guest speakers. Mm -hmm. And then she went on and got her um, program uh, it's uh, for, uh, I can't remember the initials just now, I'll get it, uh, where they uh, completed 22 um, performance standards mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. qualify for a two-year degree wow. in early chat. And Sharon and, and Cheryl went to TC3 mm -hmm. and got hers in uh, human services. Mm -hmm. And Sharon died about mm -hmm. five or six years ago, maybe less. And the uh, Padua Youth Center is the one that I had tried to get and couldn't get. Now they have two classrooms, the kitchen, and other offices mm -hmm. there. And one, of, and it's called the Sharon Johnson uh, Head Start Program. And that just goes to show mm -hmm. how successful one parent was right from the beginning. And Cheryl Valentine became head of the um, health service component. Wow. They changed the names on some of the mm -hmm. components, but uh, they still basically are following at least, first of all, opportunity for an education program preschool. Mm -hmm. Secondly, a good health services program. A third, nutrition program, mm -hmm. good food. And they're encouraged to try at least something. And these children, I always amaze me, when we brought in for the snack, cottage cheese, mm -hmm. sometimes with fruit or whatever. They love, <laughs> now I don't know if they do now, but they love cottage uh -huh. cheese. And, and there was a lot of fresh vegetables mm -hmm. and fruit and stuff. And then uh, the other was to work closely with their families in the mm -hmm. family services part. It, it, it's something that, you, you know, I, I imagine you're quite proud of, and it's also a representation, I think, pro of a program that's proven successful when you intervene and you kind of try to change the dynamic in a young child's life with that global approach. You know, so often things start off with lofty goals and they, they just don't achieve them, but it, it sounds like this is a program that started as a program that really achieves the goals that were in the original intent of the legislation. Your summarization is very good. Mm -hmm. That's what it's supposed to do. And each year, uh, the funding hopefully is increased. I, I shouldn't say this because it's po political, but I am going to say it anyways. That when the Democrats were in office, we got a little more funding. Mm -hmm. When the opposite, uh, we did not get, and we had to work very hard mm -hmm to ensure mm -hmm. that they were going to fund Head Start. Mm -hmm. And see, it's a grantee of the Community Action Program. They cannot be independent. Mm -hmm. That's how it started. They want to maintain that. But before, we couldn't own our own buildings. Mm -hmm. And I had to rent. That's why a lot of my buildings were in schools, and yeah. they're still in schools. Mm -hmm. they uh, Even where I used to work when I was in high school, from the age of 16 to um, being uh, uh, graduating from college in 62 was Mary and Margaret's ice cream oh, yeah. store at 3 Huntington Street. Mm -hmm. And now that's offices and they have classrooms there too. Mm -hmm. And so the Petawell Youth Center, the uh, Mary and Margaret's ice cream store are places that were my, per, uh, my own young life right, and so right. forth. It's and interesting. It comes full circle for that's you. That's exactly it? what I I think too, yeah. and um, uh, they they have right on South Ave, I mean South Main Street, 
the Mary Margaret Street Huntington, mm -hmm. the Padua Youth Center up above, and then they have a classroom in Randall School, mm -hmm. because you see there's a lot of uh, children that still qualify from mm -hmm. the Pendleton Street Halsey. Mm -hmm. Is most of the um, uh, funding from the federal government for, for Head Start, there's not a contribution from the county or? Uh, no. No. You, it's all federal grants. Mm -hmm. And so CAPCO, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, is considered the grantee for Head Start. Mm -hmm. And with the board of directors of CAPCO and uh, with our policy council, they have to work very closely together. Now, we'll interview for staff people, and but then they ha their names have to go before the board mm -hmm. to be approved and stuff. But in most of my interviews, I always had people that were parents that were on it, or they were from mm -hmm. policy council. They were elected officials, mm -hmm. and uh, they were 75% um, or thereabouts were parents and the other were community people. Mm -hmm. We had, uh, what is the name of the uh, Director of Social Services? The, the Commissioner of Social Services? Yeah, the Commissioner. The, the one now is Kristen Monroe? Kristen Monroe served, I don't know how many years, yeah. when I was there way mm -hmm. back then. And she, they always had a representative, we always had a representative. Mm -hmm from social services. Mm -hmm. Which makes sense. Yeah, because we were, mm -hmm. and we always tried to have some from the medical field, mm -hmm. a nurse or whatever. Yeah, which makes sense too. And so the representation of the community people sort of represented what we call the components mm -hmm. of Head Start. Right, right. And uh, they worked very closely. And I was one that I have to tell everything because I'm a talker. Mm -hmm. And so the meetings were long, but my belief was I didn't want a rubber stamp program right, right. from the policy count. Mm -hmm. And like uh, Teresa Van de Ploeg was a parent in home based, and she was from uh, near the Cincinnati area. And she uh, was on our policy council. She w and then we had her on the interview for a home based mm -hmm. teacher. <laughs> Sue Van Helsing, the ed coordinator, and I looked at each other after so many interviews and we <laughs> shook her head, we got it right here. Uh, and oh. so uh, uh -huh. we, huh. Teresa was appointed yeah. a home based visitor and yeah. she's been years, I don't know if she retired this past year or not, but she's retirement age. Do you, do you keep up with the, um, well two things, do you keep up with any of the staff that you, you uh, mentored and do you ever see any of the children that were in the program? Well, I, we didn't use formal names like Miss Content or anything. Mm -hmm. I was Miss Elaine. Mm -hmm. I am still Miss Elaine. Mm -hmm. Wherever anyone sees me, I'm Miss Elaine. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Sharon, if they were married, mm -hmm. Mrs. Sue, and Sue Van Helsdingen was made of several visits during my illness and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, Cheryl came all the way from Florida, mm -hmm. Valentine to see me two weeks ago. And I have a lot of good work cards from all oh. different people. That's, that must make you feel good. Oh, yeah. And the kids, they'll say, hi, Miss Elaine. Oh, so they and their, grand, their grandparents, some of them. Oh, my goodness. Yes, wow. they are. Wow. So there are certain families, because in the beginning, we didn't have anyone for the parent power well, of mm -hmm. involvement. And so I did that. Mm -hmm. I ran the policy mm -hmm. council. And then I had some aides. And Jerry Pinkers, who I just found mm -hmm. out the other day, uh, passed away in Florida, mm -hmm. so his daughter. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was another parent, mm -hmm. and he went to TC3 and Human Services. Mm -hmm. And then he came, he was hired to be our parent endowment sp specialist. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he read it for several years, mm -hmm. the program. And he got a lot of people, and we did a lot of activities. So forth, and we were even in the dairy parade many years. I, I don't know if they were in this year. I just didn't check the listing, but we have even won because, and the children are given field trips to the farm, to uh, the maple sugar place. Mm -hmm. I remember when I, the home base was going to have their gathering, and. Uh, 
I was invited, and that was near Derrider and uh, um, what's the name of the place just before Derrider? Kyler. 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 Yes. Mm -hmm. And we went to a house, and the grandmother had the children, and uh, she used a can to chop up the salad and mm -hmm. stuff, and and they tapped maple syrup, mm -hmm. and we had mm -hmm. the maple nice. syrup and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So, and then there was other opportunities when all the parents would come together mm -hmm. rather than just the children, right. and they would do activities mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And we were in the Kyler Church for a short while, too. Really? Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. So that was in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So you see, we have impacted, mm -hmm. Head Start has impacted mm -hmm. on Cortland County. And um, you probably don't know, maybe you could guess, from when it started to maybe perhaps when you, you left, how many children were impacted or came through the, the, the program? I used to know. <laughs> I cannot remember. Yeah. Now, it's got to be thousands, right? Well, if it's not thousands, it's pretty close to that. Yeah. Uh, because I don't have any concept of the program's number now, mm -hmm. but they go from early, pre early childhood. Mm -hmm right up to five years old. Mm -hmm. And the, the feedback I, I received from a lot of the prince, uh, pr uh, the elementary teachers, the kindergarten teachers, was always like when McCabe mm -hmm. and um, yeah. they uh, said that Head Start was, mm -hmm. made their job much mm -hmm. easier. Mm -hmm. And the children had a lot of exposure. Mm -hmm. They're not as, Their appearance isn't as poverty appearing mm -hmm. as what that in sixty I mean in seventy three we had a high poverty mm -hmm. poverty mm -hmm. level. And uh, we uh, used to provide at Christmas times when the community agencies wanted to help, always to buy them underpants mm -hmm. right. and uh, other things that were necessary just to be able to be dressed up and, and, and so forth. It seems like now, I, 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 this is probably not, it, I'm not talking from experience, but it just seems to me that now the, um, the impoverishment or the poverty may be more in the environmental aspect in that their, their uh, environment is impoverished. They don't have the exposure to books or learning or, um, no, that's what it was in the beginning. Mm -hmm. they, they, they have an ex extremely large library system, mm -hmm. plus the parts of the uh, Christmas holidays gifts for books, mm -hmm. and they could be used books right. or everything. That's one of the things that we tried to encourage was the parents to read to the children. It's so important because, uh, as I say, I don't think it, the homes that some of the kids come from uh, they're exposed to much of that, or it's, it's revered or honored or, or thought of something positive. That was later, but mm -hmm. I think now we're improving. Okay. And even the clothing that the children are wearing yeah. are better. But we still have a high poverty level yes, in Portland. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I want to go back to Kyler for a few minutes, they, I, in Alaska, we had no plumbing mm. or anything like that. We had what they called a honey bucket <laughs> and so forth. Kyler, at that time in 73, is the extension of Appalachia. Yes. And uh, the uh, program that's on Pomeroy Street, the daycare program there, mm -hmm. they started the next year after we did in 74 as an Appalachian right. program. Right. And they, in turn, uh, received funding for so many years, and then they had to get their own funding. Mm -hmm. That's tough. So that's a program to be admired, too. Yes. And is. Alan Page has worked hard on yes. being a director for it, mm -hmm. and several other people that mm -hmm. I knew. So uh, we have the, the daycare program on Pomeroy Street, we have all the services of Head Start. Mm -hmm. And then I had also worked with Dan McNeil and um, the director of 
uh, Francisco Racker Center. Oh, yes, right. And uh, he had the building where the Francisco Racker Center was, uh, used to be a, uh, an entertainment center. Mm -hmm. And we talked, and we talked to Jim, the one that was the director of uh, a, uh, Racker, Racker mm -hmm. Center. And that's, we went in there for mm -hmm. five years mm -hmm. together. We renovated, mm -hmm. we put the playground in. They took, we rented from yes. this uh, Racker Center. Uh -huh. But uh, Dan owned it. I don't know if he owns it mm -hmm. now or not. Yeah. That's still many years now. But mm -hmm. the whole thing is we have the Francisco Racker Center. My niece works there. She's oh. in the home services. Mm -hmm. And she has uh, the adult clients. Mm -hmm. And uh, she does, tries to find homes for them. And when they're on own, she's mm -hmm. so she's their mentor, mm -hmm. and uh, so there's that. I don't want to tire you out. Are you getting tired? A little bit, but I I, I wanted to give a broad perspective mm -hmm. of so much that has impacted on Cortland County yeah. through child care. Well, you've got a, a, a encyclopedia inside your head there. You remember so much so well, and and the fact that you were involved at the very beginning. And some of the names that you mentioned, I, I recognize because you and I are the same era. I was in the field of aging, you're in the field of youth. Uh, so it, it's fascinating to hear this, and it, it's, um, it's wonderful that you're willing to share it so we can preserve well, it. Well, I've been wanting to do it for so long. Yeah. Matter of fact, in the garage, I think they're all ruined now. But they didn't keep any of our scrapbooks or anything. Mm -hmm. And maybe if we have a chance and you help me, we could walk to the garage and mm -hmm. see if I can find a picture or two. Mm -hmm. But up until 1999, I I had everything that we kept because mm -hmm. I was a believer yeah. in pictures and stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's since 73, there's so much more. Mm -hmm. There was, a, mm -hmm. like I say, the Child Development Center mm -hmm. and then the YWCA, right. the YMCA. Uh, and the Racker Center and uh, all these new programs mm -hmm. to have mm -hmm. start from uh, pre uh, preschool. I mean, not preschool, but uh, the early childhood right. through preschool. Right. Yeah, the county has something too. Early, early intervention program. I don't know if it still exists. That was a home-based program too. But I think we'll. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wrap up this part of it and maybe uh, a little, maybe at some future date I can go in and see some of your pictures. <laughs> well, and anything that you have forgotten to say on this particular interview, oh, uh, I know you've got more. And I would like to hear a little more about your life growing up in Portland too, but I think, I think we'll wrap it up now because I don't want to tire you out. Can I just make a last statement of course. in conclusion? Okay. okay. I was born in 1940, just before World War II, and we lived at South Ave. Mm -hmm. South Ave is now, I mean, not South Ave. We lived at Railway Ave, 20, 28 and a half Railway Ave, and then it became, in the 40s, South Ave. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we were all working class people, mm -hmm. and Wickwares was still in existence yeah. then, and uh, my father worked there for 37 years and then lost his retirement mm -hmm. when they went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. The only good thing was he was hired as a custodian at the high school by Tony Fabrizio. And I don't know what we would have done mm -hmm. because my mother became very ill. She mm -hmm. died at 59 uh -huh. and so forth. And then my brother was going to be bored and the apartment we had was too small. And so there's a big house that looks like a barn. Mm -hmm. We were the first to go there. We had the best apartment. But they were cold, cold water flats. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dad worked with players. My mother was unable to work. And I have to tell you, I am so proud that through my parents that not only did I get the job by Mary Preziozo under Mr. Everett Stalter and Mrs. Stalter, at Mary and Margaret's from age 16 
on until I graduated from college, I uh, saved my money and I was able to go to Portland mm -hmm. and become both getting my B um, bachelor's, bachelor of, of arts degree and my master's degree. It's, it's remarkable. BA. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Yes. A girl from across the railroad mm -hmm. tracks mm -hmm. succeeded. Okay. And that wasn't the way. My graduating class of 58, God bless some of them, some of them have really excelled. But uh, the fact was, for a woman, mm -hmm. you either went, took the business course, and I fortunately, through my uncle, took the college entrance mm -hmm. course. Yeah. And uh, that was unusual. Mm -hmm. And then you could become a hairdresser, right. or you went to the Crescent Corsa Company, right. yep. or Smith Corona. Right. And those were the places for yeah. people to. So I just have so much. Mm -hmm. a, 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 what's the word I want? Uh, Gratitude? Just give pride? me. Pride? You should have pride. Well, okay, <laughs> I'll use the word pride. Admiration is what uh -huh. I was looking for, uh, is to tell them that you can succeed mm -hmm. if you want to. Mm -hmm. So Head Start is like my life, mm -hmm. that if you take advantage of it, you have a lot of opportunities ahead. I, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly, although I will say uh, it takes uh, an exceptional person like yourself to not only pave a path that wasn't traditional for those times to achieve, but then to start a program from scratch uh, that is a phenomenal accomplishment, and then to, to have such an impact, it's not only a program that still exists, but it has an impact on people's lives. That's why I use the word pride. You should be pride, proud. I, I, I'm, I'm proud to be able to interview you. You're, you're a remarkable lady. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I didn't think about the word pride, but I am pleased with what I accomplished. You, you have your good and you have your bad. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of really struggles between yes. yeah. the years of mm -hmm. 26. Sure. But still, I'm happy to be mm -hmm. a part of the Head Start mm -hmm. program and the, Head, the CAPCO program from John or Jim Whipple when I never even applied for the director's <laughs> position. <laughs> but you got it anyway. I got it anyways. <laughs> Thank you so much. Elena. My pleasure. I Thank you, Sharon.